Hi class, Dr. Jim here. Next lecture on the docket is the eukaryotes. And so we already talked previously about the prokaryotes. And if you haven't seen that video yet, I highly recommend you watching that one first before you get into the eukaryotes. It's not that it's that you need the one with the other, but I think it will make a lot of points a little bit more understanding for you to kind of get more out of it in that because we talked about the prokaryotes being cells without a nucleus and then today what we're focusing in on is the eukaryotes and one of the interesting topics we're going to talk about in this lecture is that the eukaryotes arose from the prokaryotes by a way of symbiosis and so really you need to have an understanding of the prokaryotes first so if you haven't seen the prokaryote video I would recommend going and watching that one first and then watching this lecture so anyways, let's get on to the eukaryotic cells. So the first thing we're going to look at today is what are the eukaryotes? We're going to try and figure out what these guys are, what they're made of. And really, they're just cells that have a nucleus, and then they have a lot of internal structures, these little tiny cellular features that they have that the prokaryotes don't have. Then we're going to talk about the endosymbiont theory. And this is an important theory that came out in the last 10, 15, maybe 20 years it's been really talked about and this is the idea that the eukaryotic cells arose from the prokaryotes that the eukaryotes didn't just show up one day but it was this culmination of the prokaryotes coming together and due to the change environmental changes that were going on in the earth at that time led to the creation of the eukaryotes and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along then we'll talk more about the internal structures. There's a lot of different internal structures in the eukaryotes. So unlike the prokaryotes, which is most of the fun stuff's on the outside, in the eukaryotes, most of the fun stuff's on the inside. And then we'll finally finish up a little bit between the differences of animal and plant cells. And you've already seen a lot of the differences in the lab. We talked about cell walls versus cell membranes and things like that. We also talked about chloroplasts in plant cells. Animal cells don't have those, and so we'll talk a little bit about those as well and kind of get some differences that go on. So anyways, let's begin. So the eukaryotes are called eukaryotes because they're considered the true nucleus or true kernel, like we've talked about before. You meaning true, and this is a true nucleus or true cells that have nucleus. They have a nucleus where the DNA is stored. And they also have these little machines on the inside called organelles. And we call these little machines that have specific functions. And we're going to talk all about these different machines today in this lecture. They're much larger than the prokaryotes. And I think I mentioned that before in the prokaryotic video that they can range from anywhere from 100 to 1,000 times bigger. And you'll see this in the lab when you look at it, the difference in eukaryotic cells, which are pretty large. You can see those pretty well in the microscope, whereas the prokaryotes are pretty tiny. They really sometimes are real difficult. If they're not stained well or you have a bad slide, it makes it real difficult to see anything. So again, talk about the plant cells and the animal cells, and we're going to talk more about those later on. Again, the big difference is the really the structure, the cell walls and the chloroplasts of the plant cells versus just the cell membrane and no chloroplasts in the animal cells. And we'll talk more about it like that in a few minutes. Okay, so really where did the eukaryotes come from. If we look at this figure here, it just kind of shows you a timeline of where things evolved from. And so the earth came about about 15 billion years ago based on the evidence that we know about the rocks and things like that. And then it took a long, long time, about anywhere from 4 billion to 3.5 billion years ago that the prokaryotes first appeared. So it took, you know, a matter of almost 10 billion years for 10 to 11 billion years for all those organic molecules one to be made and then eventually come into becoming cells. And then when that happened, the prokaryotes ruled the earth for really about two and a half billion years because they lasted and we didn't see any eukaryotes until about the time about 1.75 to 1.5 billion years. And so really the prokaryotes have been around for a long, long time where the eukaryotes have appeared in, in the life of the earth a very short period of time. If you continue to look, it's kind of interesting to see. If you look at this one, you can see that humans appeared really at the end of the scale. And if you kind of put this together like a clock, think of a, a clock on the wall. If you look in the lab, we have the old fashioned clock on the wall and you think of it as a time of the day. Let's say the earth's formed at midnight on Sunday morning. So you're going out on a party on Saturday night and midnight hits, the earth forms that at midnight. 
and you go all the way around 12 hours, all the way around to almost 24 hours, if you go to 11.59 and 59 seconds of Sunday night into Monday morning, that's when you finally see humans appearing on the Earth. So it is a really small amount of time. So it takes a lot of time, not only to make the organic molecules, but then to make the prokaryotes, and then the eukaryotes come along, and then evolution as it goes along in that steps. Okay, so I keep talking about this endosymbiont theory, and that's the idea where prokaryotes arose and formed a eukaryotic cell. And really the reason for that was due to environmental change. When you think about the earth at the time that the prokaryotes ruled the earth, there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. There wasn't anything making oxygen. There wasn't anything breathing oxygen at that time. And so the atmosphere was a very anoxygen environment. It had a lot of nitrogen, had a lot of carbon dioxide and some other things in there. And really the prokaryotes thrived, the anaerobic ones that could use other sources for electron transport that, that were there. However, as photosynthesis got going, one of the byproducts of photosynthesis is oxygen. And due to this photosynthesis, this process of converting sunlight into energy, you get this release of oxygen. And due to all this, these photosynthetic bacteria that had these pigments actually started releasing a ton of oxygen in the atmosphere. And this changed how the environment became. Oxygen is toxic to those anaerobic bacteria, and in order for those guys to survive, they needed new mechanisms in order to deal with the oxygen. And so that's kind of where they believe that this happened. And so what they think it would happen is that these large anaerobic bacteria that were thriving, you know, thriving around the world at that time started swallowing up these little tiny anaerobic bacteria, and they became what is known as a symbiont of the cell. And we think of this as the mitochondria, which use oxygen to make energy, and then also the chloroplasts that are responsible for photosynthesis. So not only did they take the ones that could use oxygen, but also have the little energy generating ones that could use the sun. And that kind of made the plant and animal cells. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit, but that's kind of the idea behind it. And if you watch this video that I have linked up and on my YouTube channel, you really will see what I'm talking about in, the, in this situation. And I think it will, it's it cartoonish, but it, I think it's a good video to just kind of show you the, what I was talking about in that past video. Now, what is some evidence that we have? Well, we can look at the mitochondria itself and it looks very similar to some of the bacteria that we see today in, in, the, in the world. And so we can say that the mitochondria look very similar to some of the bacteria that we find. The mitochondria that we have in our cells have DNA and ribosomes that are very similar to what are found in bacteria. So they have the 70S ribosomes and they have DNA that's very similar to what we find in bacteria. You look at mitochondria, they replicate independently of the cell and they replicate much like a bacteria does by binary fission. And so that's another one that we look at. And then also the size and shape. If you look at the size and the shape of a mitochondria, it really looks like a tiny bacteria cell that's been taken in by another cell. And so for all this evidence, membranes, DNA, ribosomes, mitochondria, replication, and the size and shape, that gives us a lot of evidence that this theory must be or really pretty much true. And we could say the same thing about chloroplasts. If you look at chloroplasts and kind of compare it, we see very similar things. And so that's where we get this evidence for this endosymbiosis, that they work together and it actually became eukaryotic cells. So let's talk about the inside structure of the eukaryotic cells. So on the outside, we'll talk a little bit about plant cell walls and things like that, but really most of the fun stuff of the eukaryotic cells is on the inside. And we have to begin with the nucleus. The nucleus is where the DNA and all your genes are held. The blueprints for your cell are held inside that nucleus. It's surrounded by a bilipid membrane and it has these little holes, which will make a lot more sense in a couple weeks when we start talking about RNA and DNA and RNA has to get in and out of the cell or in and out of the nucleus, I should say. And so these holes that are in the, in the nucleus are required for the RNA, but this area is a situation or like a capital for the cell. I call it like the brain of the cell. This is where all the blueprints, all the instructions to for that cell to do what it needs to do is found in here. And that's the nucleus. A second thing that all eukaryotic cells have are ribosomes. And we've talked about ribosomes already in the prokaryotes. And ribosomes are very similar to what we see in the prokaryotes, but they're a little bit bigger 
in the in the eukaryotes. They're a little bit larger instead of the 70s that we see in prokaryotes. These are actually 80s, so they're a little bit bigger, a little bit heavier. And again, they have the same function as they do in prokaryotes. They make the proteins. And so they're really important for that structure function, making proteins in that cell. So they get the information from the RNA, the DNA that's in the nucleus, and then the next step, it goes to RNA, and then finally proteins. And we're going to talk more about the ribosomes when we get into DNA transcription translation. And that will make a lot more sense. But just know that all cells have ribosomes, and it's outside the nucleus. Okay? Now we can start talking about the organelles. And like I mentioned before, organelles are these little machines that are found inside of all eukaryotic cells. There's really two types. They're the ones that are based on membranes or attached to membranes and really attached to the nuclear membrane. And this includes the endoplasmic reticulum, or ER for short, and then the Golgi apparatus. And these are used for packaging. And we'll talk more about these in just a minute. The other type of organelles that we see in eukaryotic cells are the energy related. Now, all cells have mitochondria. All cells need to make energy, need to make ATP, so they all have mitochondria in them. And that's one thing we know. The other thing that certain cells, plant cells in, in particular, have chloroplasts. These are the guys responsible for photosynthesis. We cannot sit on the sun and take all the sun's rays in and make energy out of it. We do not have chloroplasts. So we can only just sit out in the sun and get burned. It doesn't really help us and any, do anything. But in plant cells, they have those cells. They're green. They absorb the energy and make and, or absorb the sunlight, make the energy for the plant. And so the plant doesn't have to eat. So those are the two different types of organelles. We then can look at the two types of endoplasmic reticulum. So this is the first organelle. This is a membrane-bound organelle. It's called the endoplasmic reticulum, and really it comes off the nucleus. Now there are two types. There's the rough, and the rough stands for the rough or the ribosomes that are found on the ER, and this is responsible for making proteins. So think of rough ER makes proteins. The other type of ER that we have is smooth. Think of slippery, smooth, slippery. This makes the lipids and fats of the cells. And so you have two types of ER associated. You have the rough makes the proteins and the smooth that makes the lipids or the fats. Okay. Another type of organelle that's membrane in nature is called the Golgi apparatus. And these guys take what is made from the ER and packages them up. So they either package them up for the cell itself to use later on, maybe for storage, or to put it into a special type of vesicle that can be used for something that it needs, or it could be like the post office and package something up to send out to other cells or to other organisms or whatever the cell needs it for. Could be toxins, could be food, could be a lot of different things that the Golgi does. But the main idea of the Golgi body or Golgi apparatus is to package. So think of that as like the post office of the cell. Okay. And then we have lysosomes. And lysosomes are membrane-bound organelles that basically store things to when the cell eats to digest them. And so these are really found only in animal cells most of the time. You do see them sometimes in plant cells, but animal cells primarily because animal cells have to eat in order to get energy. And so what you see these associated a lot of times is digesting uh, materials that actually come into the cell. Whether they phagocytosis or do something, they eat the, eat the energy or eat the materials that come in. Now the two energy generating organelles we've talked about before are the mitochondria and the chloroplast. Now the mitochondria are these bean-shaped organelles that have a lot of these internal membranes. And if you remember from the prokaryotes, remember I talked about surface area? The reason for this folding is the surface area. More surface area allows you to generate more energy. And so that's why we see this folding on the inside of the membrane. It means you can make more energy if you have a lot more surface area. So always associate more surface area, more efficient, more energy generating, more efficiency, okay? Think about that. The other thing I, I like to talk about is dark muscle. So you guys like to eat chicken. You have white meat and dark meat. White meat are muscle cells that don't have a lot of mitochondria. Dark meat are ones that do. So where do you see the dark meat? In wings and legs of chickens because that's what they use to move. And so you need lots of energy to move those muscles. And so that's why they're dark. And so that's why you see dark meat with associated with legs and wings and thighs because those are the muscles that you use to move your body. You don't really see it in the breast tissue or the chest tissue because you're not really moving those around. And so that's the difference. And so that gives you something to know about that. 
Okay, the other generating organelle is chloroplasts, and chloroplasts are responsible for generating and absorbing sunlight and turning it into ATP, and or actually turning in ATP and glucose. And we're going to talk more about this. I think uh, Jill is going to mention this more in her lectures in the coming weeks. But right now, we wanted you to know at least about that the chloroplasts are found only in plants and algae. And so they're the energy generating where they take in the sun and convert it into sugar. And we'll talk more about that when we get to photosynthesis in a couple weeks. Okay. Now, if you look at the animal cells, animal cells lack the cell wall. That's the biggest thing. If you want to talk about the difference between plants and animals, the biggest thing, missing a cell wall in animal cells and no chloroplasts. And that's really the same. The other thing is, is that animal cells tend to move. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the movement of these cells real quick here about the cilia and about the flagella that animal cells have. Now, the two types of locomotion that eukaryotes have are flagella and the cilia. Flagella are different, and you remember the prokaryotes spin their flagella around like a propeller, whereas the flagella and eukaryotes kind of use a wave. So think of the little sperm cells swimming towards the egg. That's how flagella move in eukaryotes. All eukaryotes do that. And the other thing that eukaryote cells have are cilia. Cilia are hair-like structures that like to wave in the same direction. So they use this thing, this rhythmic beating of their hair to move things. So they can use it for movement, they can use it for filtering, they can use it for feeding. And so they have a lot of different uh, aspects with that. Really where we see this in us is in our, in our trachea. We have these cilia that move the things out. And what happens is during the middle of the night, all the stuff that you're breathing in during the day that get trapped in your lungs get pushed out of your cilia in your trachea and then swallowed and then you lose it down down into your belly and so that's one of the ways that we use as a defense mechanism and so that's the cilia allowing us to move these things now if you really want to see how things move and again eukaryotic cells move again I have a nice little video it's only about one to two minutes long that allows you to see how eukaryotic flagella and cilia move. I think it's a really good idea just to get an idea. See the, some of the differences between that. And you can even compare, go back and forth between the prokaryotes and eukaryotes and see if there's any differences that you can notice between those things. Okay. Another thing that animal cells have are these centrioles. And centrioles are real important for splitting the cell. And we're going to get into cell reproduction here in another couple of weeks when we talk about genetics and cell division, mitosis and meiosis, and centrioles are really important for animal cells to split. They need something to kind of give them an anchor to pull their cells apart, and that's what centrioles are. And we'll talk more about these in chapter nine when we get up to it, when we get into mitosis and meiosis. So hold that thought until then, but centrioles are there. Now on plant cells, plant cells, like I said, the difference between plants and animals, the biggest difference is the cell wall. It gives us its structure, the brick-like structure that you see in plant cells. And then the other thing is the chloroplast. So think of those two things, plant cells, cell walls, chloroplast. Animal cells, no cell wall, no chloroplast, okay? Think of those two things. The only difference that you really see in plant cells, if you look at microscopically, versus the animal cell also is sometimes you see these large vacuoles and they help store water and that gives it some rigidity in their cells and so again when you're talking about plant cells and animal cells i think the biggest thing is knowing the cell wall versus no cell wall chloroplast versus no chloroplast if you're going to divide it up that way but we do see these vacuoles in plant cells as well along with centrioles and animal cells and those are some other subtle differences that you might see as well Okay, so to summarize this lecture, we're already to the end. The endosymbiont theory is again the idea that prokaryotes arose to eukaryotes. So the prokaryotes came together to work in symbiosis together to be able to tough it out in the new environment that was created in the earth. Now, and then we also looked at the organelles of the eukaryotes. So remember, there's some that are membrane like, these include the ER, which make proteins and lipids, or I'm yeah, proteins and lipids. And then we also have the Golgi, which is the packaging, the post office. We also have the energy related, which are the mitochondria found in all cells. And we have the uh, chloroplasts, which are only found in plant cells. And this again, sunlight to sugar. And then finally, the difference animals and plants. I harp on this all the time, but you can see in the lecture, no cell wall, no chloroplasts, they, and they move, whereas the plant, cell walls, chloroplasts, and they don't move. You don't see plants getting up and running around. If you have a garden, you don't see them moving around. Okay, and with that, 
this is the end of this lecture. If you have any questions, please send me an email or anything that you might have questions in the lab, please feel free to ask. Thanks for watching.